The assassination of an Austrian Archduke on a fine summer's day in Sarajevo was the shot that started the greatest war the world had ever seen. In actual fact, the fuse was lit 20 or 30 years before the powder keg that was World War I exploded. Royal marriages, alliances, empires, invasions, plots and counterplots, it now seems inevitable through hindsight that this massive worldwide conflagration would eventually occur. The seeds of revolution planted years before began to sprout everywhere, most notably in the Russian Empire. The Russian throne had survived 300 years, but was destined to fall before this war was over. These decades of civil unrest caused another explosion, a diaspora of emigrants from Europe to all corners of the globe. The millions who fled carried with them the strength, talent and culture that would mold the character of the countries that welcomed them, America, Canada, and Australia. Come forward 90 years. On September 25, 2007, a small official ceremony went almost unnoticed at the solemn shrine of remembrance in Melbourne, Australia. One of the last remaining members of the Russian royal family, accompanied by the first secretary of the Russian embassy, dedicated a small memorial. The Grand Duchess Maria Vladimirovna, accompanied by Mr. Artyom Kozhin, did the honors. As a cousin of Tsar Nicholas II, the Grand Duchess is the last living connection with the pre-revolutionary Russian throne. She is also 109th in line of succession to the British throne. Notice the striking resemblance to Queen Victoria. Of course, Victoria was directly related to most of the royal heads of Europe. The ghosts of Tsarist Russia and the living Russian Federation acting together officially is always a significant event. More significant, though, is the purpose of this memorial. It is very much Australian. It is to honor the 1,000 Russian-born Anzacs who fought for Australia in World War I the Great War. ANZAC is an acronym for Australian New Zealand Army Corps, originally the collective name for the soldiers who joined the Allied Expeditionary Forces, the name stuck and became synonymous with valor and mateship. As well as recognizing these largely forgotten Anzacs from Russia, the dedication was also for the Russian emigres who have fought for this country ever since. Russian-born Anzacs continued to fight for Australia right through World War II and the Vietnam War. It is a little-known fact that over 1,000 Russian-born young men joined the call and enlisted to fight in the Great War for Australia. These men came from diverse communities in Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Belarus, Georgia, Russia and the Ukraine. Names like Chepovsky, Kamyshansky and Kavalsky fought alongside names like Breitman, Alksen, Greshner, Meyer, and Averkov. And close to one in five Russian Anzacs perished, the same ratio as the Australian-born soldiers. Fleeing persecution and civil unrest in Mother Russia, these men were not afraid to settle in Australia and take on any position offered to them. Even without a solid grasp of the English language, these men still eagerly enlisted in the AIF. Letter to home. Dear mama and sister, my time in the Australian army is good. I am learning English fast, I have to. Yes, sergeant, no sergeant, right away, sergeant. And bloody this, and bloody that, bloody Russian. Not uh, real blood, just the word. 
It means like, damn, I have seen the pyramids of Egypt. Can you believe? I send all my love, Sasha. While the legend of the Anzacs from Russia wasn't a complete mystery, it was not a well-thumbed chapter in Australian war history. It required someone of proud Russian heritage to put the pieces together. Russian-born historian Dr. Yelena Gover came to Australia in 1990. On a visit to the Australian War Memorial in the national capital, Gover was intrigued at the many Russian names listed as fallen soldiers amongst the memorials. And so began her 10-year quest to uncover the amazing story of the Anzacs from Russia. This detailed research culminated in the publishing of her book, Russian Anzacs. The task of uncovering these stories was long and arduous for Yelena Gover. The army enlistment papers were not sorted by ethnic background. Elena had to work through the records individually, spotting Russian-sounding names, then digging further to find any descendants. Gover successfully tracked down many of the soldiers' families, giving her tale a decidedly personal feeling. Yelena Gover's long-standing association with the National Archives of Australia has meant that her book, in spirit, also pays tribute to those many soldiers who were not from Anglo backgrounds, largely forgotten in the Anzac legend. Not all of the Russian Anzacs were completely unknown. Norman Meyer, the young cousin of the founders of the mighty Australian retail empire, literally walked off the boat from Belarus and into the ranks of the Russian Anzacs to fight for his new country. Pamela Meyer is the daughter of Russian Anzac Norman Meyer. Growing up in Australia in the 30s and 40s, Pamela traveled the world as an envoy for the Meyer retail empire. My father was born in Tatarsk, in Belarus, was brought to this country by his uncle, Sidney Meyer, who had founded what was to become a burgeoning retail empire in Australia. Norman arrived in February 1909. He lived with his uncle, Sidney, who was basically his guardian. He helped his uncle down in Bendigo, where he had established four wonderful shops and had an eye on building the Meyer Emporium in Burke Street, Melbourne. When World War I broke out, Meyer immediately enlisted in the army and was sent to France to fight in the trenches. During his time as head of the, the store, the store grew to be among one of the five greatest, most successful retailing uh, organizations in the world. He showed his real character, he was extremely strong, very determined, very ambitious, very simple, very humane. And I think the, the, his time with serving in France and in the army had brought out these characteristics and turned the, a young, deprived Russian boy into uh, a great Australian man. A woman of considerable accomplishment, Pamela was appointed chair of the Museum of Modern Art of Australia in 1961 and continues to progress her arts administration and charitable work today. On April 25th, we landed on the coastline of Turkey at a place called Gallipoli. I was told this was partly to relieve the pressure on the Imperial Russian forces in the Caucasus which we thought was a, a great laugh. There are around 30 of us in the various battalions here. I trained as a light horseman, but I don't see myself riding up these steep cliffs. We would probably have to eat the horses first. Kazis Vlinkevich, 16th Battalion, AIF. The highest-ranking Anzac from Russia was no doubt Lieutenant Colonel Elizar Margolin, an officer in the famous 16th Battalion at the landing at Gallipoli. He also fought on the Western Front where he was wounded. Margolin was awarded the DSO, 
Margolin's was a classic tale of escaping religious persecution as a Jew in Russia, first to Palestine and then Australia. Rodney Gutman is a senior political analyst at the Bnei Brit Anti-Defamation Commission. He has lectured at the University of South Australia, the University of Massachusetts, and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He is the author of the book An Anzac Zionist Hero about the life and career of Lieutenant Colonel Elizar Margolin. Finding out about him was very difficult because he left no memoirs, he left no writings. He found out that he was a very famous person in the early years of Jewish settlement in Palestine. But as far as in Australia is concerned, very little was known about him. Elizar Margolin was born in 1875 in Belgorod, Russia, on the eastern side of what was known as the Pale of Jewish Settlement. When he was 17, his parents took the family to Palestine to escape the pogroms. They settled in the Zionist colony of Rehovot, where Margolin became active in the Zionist cause. Ten years later, Margolin moved to Australia, taking advantage of an easing in non-British migration. He joined the Western Australian Infantry Regiment in 1911. So when the war broke out in 1914, he was given a commission of captain in the 4th Brigade of the 16th Battalion, AIF. Margolin and his men were amongst the first ashore at Gallipoli on April 25th. And he was in charge of the last cohort of Australians to leave the beaches a year and a half later. Many considered Margolin charmed against injury. The men used to joke that the bullet evaded him. There was a story told he could have been wounded, but a pocketbook in his top pocket of his tunic saved him from that fate. Margolin returned to Egypt and then went to the Western Front with his 16th Battalion. There he was wounded to such a degree that he had to leave the front. He was actually able to afford to travel to England to recuperate at his own expense. Margolin had won the DSO in Gallipoli. He was mentioned in dispatches in both Gallipoli and the Western Front. When the war ended, the British Army noted his previous experience and he was posted as the first governor of the British Protectorate of Palestine. There, he helped maintain the peace between the Jews and Arabs. After three years, Alizar Margolin retired from the British Army and returned home where he settled again in Western Australia. He dies in, this, in 1944. One of the things in his will was that when the new state, a new state of Israel was formed, his remains would be taken back to Palestine. And of course, in 1948, was a new state of Israel. So his, his wife honored that agreement. She takes him back in 1950. They were met by an honor guard in the north of Haifa port. He was laid to rest adjacent to his parents in the military cemetery in Rehovot. For the first time ever, the Jewish prayer of Kaddish was intoned over his body. And we can probably say for the first time, he really came to rest in the place he always wanted to return. And that was Palestine, and that was the Jewish state when it was formed. And so ends the story of both, a true Zionist hero of Israel and a distinguished Russian Anzac hero of Australia. Russian Anzac Alexander Yegorov had to sleep outside the trenches as the Australian soldiers told him there was not enough room inside them. He covered himself with blankets outside, but the fierce winter made his hands stiff by the morning. His granddaughter, Barbara Fox, said that Alexander bore no grudges against these men. On Anzac Day every year, he would put on his suit and head into town for the reunion of his battalion comradeship being of the utmost importance to him. William George Averkov added two years onto his real age of 18 years in order to join up to the AIF, despite being his family's breadwinner. 
His father had died just a few years earlier, leaving William to take care of his large family that included six young brothers and sisters. William George Averkoff never returned from the war. Michael Klachko was first attached to the British Army where he worked in the medical unit as a doctor and plastic surgeon. In July 1915, he was transferred to the AIF, working in the Australian General Hospital, where his work, primarily as a plastic surgeon, was highly praised by his commanders. Douglas Engman is his grandson. My grandfather joined the Russian Army and was on his way being shipped out when his ship was captured by a German ship. And he was captured and uh, was a prisoner when the German ship was overtaken by a British ship and liberated um, uh, in the Mediterranean. My grandfather not uh, uh, being able to go back to Russia uh, because of the war uh, joined up with the uh, British Army uh, and the uh, uh, Anzacs and was posted to Egypt. Uh, he served uh, on the battlefield organizing a military hospital, um, uh, taking care of soldiers with uh, face and jaw uh, and mouth injuries since his specialty was uh, oral surgery. I was also told that he spent some time at Gallipoli uh, helping treat the wounded uh, in that uh, famous battle. After the war, and he went with some of his Australian compatriots uh, to Melbourne. And in Melbourne, very active in Melbourne society through his uh, Australian um, relatives, uh, friends, and that's where he met my uh, grandmother. Not all of the Russian Anzac stories are triumphant. Justin Gulaev firmly believed that if a country was worth living in, it was worth fighting for. And so he joined the AIF. But like many others, Gulaev was later purged from the 4th Division on account of Russian nationality. He lived the remainder of his days on a farm in Queensland. Walter Kalashnikov enlisted in the AIF in 1915. He was nearly blinded in an explosion the same year. Virtually incapacitated, he was sent to Brisbane, where he struggled to regain his life. He applied to become an Australian citizen in 1918, as it was hard for him to obtain work without it. But even with his war record, authorities branded him as a Bolshevik of dangerous propensities. His application was denied. The local return servicemen's league tried to defend him, and a Queensland politician even raised his case in Parliament, but to no avail. Kalashnikov was never granted naturalization. His health declined rapidly, and he died within two years. Stories from the trenches were not all grim amongst the Anzacs from Russia. On Christmas Eve 1916, a former marine engineer from Estonia named Peter Metzer was serving at the artillery center at Etapel, France. Metzer had lost a hundred franc note in a bet and bemoaned his loss to a friend. His colonel entered and remarked on Metzer's distress. Metzer ballooned his loss from 100 francs to 500 francs. The colonel handed him a banknote, which Metzer quickly pocketed. Later on, Metzer discovered that it was a bill for 1,000 francs, worth over 800 US dollars today. Even more amazing, the Anzac from Russia discovered that the colonel who had given him the bill was Albert I, the King of Belgium, visiting the troops incognito. There is a very large Russian-born émigré population in Australia of approximately 20,000, with 1,000 arriving every year. In fact, Russia and Australia have a long history together, going back over 200 years to the very beginning. In August 1807, the Imperial Russian naval ship Neva was one of the first foreign vessels to make an official visit to Port Jackson, later known as Sydney. Captain Bly was the governor of New South Wales. The Rum Rebellion was a few weeks away. Napoleon was rattling his saber around Europe. 
and Great Britain was an ally of Imperial Russia. Over the years, this relationship has run both hot and cold, including fears of an actual Russian invasion of Australia in the 1870s. But in 2007, this 200-year association is celebrated as a major part of Australia's culture with a ball. Russian ambassador to Australia, Mr. Blachin. Of course, we are aware about the Russian-born soldiers who fought in the Australian army, even more so during the periods of World War I and World War II. Russia and Australia were on the same side. I knew that these soldiers were not just fighting, they were volunteers. I realized they had to fulfill the obligation to the country where they had come to live. We really appreciate what they were doing, and we believe Australian society does as well. I really believe Australian society will recognize these fallen soldiers of Russian descent. And one day, some sort of monument will be erected to pay tribute to them. That's why we are here now, because Melbournians recognize the impact these men had on Australian history. One of the most recent Russian Anzacs is Alex Ilyin. Alex was born in Harbin, China, a far eastern enclave of Russian refugees not far from Vladivostok. In 1959, he emigrated to Australia with his mother and grandmother. In 1967, he enlisted in the Australian army for two years, the last six months being stationed in Vietnam. He won five military medals for his time in Vietnam and has an Order of Australia from the Queen, as well as many more medals from the Australian and Russian governments. I wasn't the only Russian, there were quite a few Russians involved in the Vietnam War. Uh, being conscripted from New South Wales, as in Victoria, there's about three that I know of. Could be quite, uh, could be a lot more. Uh, but uh, the feeling is, we are part of this country, you don't take, you've got to give as well. And we're proud to be Australians and we serve the country same as every other Australian. The involvement between Australia and Russia at the time didn't end with the armistice. Between 1918 and 1921, Russia was in turmoil. A three-way civil war had grown out of the October Revolution. A group of Australian soldiers was sent to Russia as part of a 14-nation allied intervention force. Another proud but obscure chapter of the Anzac legend was forged in Russia in 1919 when Sergeant Samuel Pierce from Mildura won a posthumous Victoria Cross as part of his action. The bond forged by the Anzacs from Russia with Australia is as strong as it has ever been, made all the stronger through the selfless sacrifice of those soldiers for their adopted country. Not only is this a unique story of Australian comradeship that has never been fully appreciated, it is a chapter we must never forget.